around the world, we're building very powerful information systems now for communication and for many other things as well. We being just the all of us, uh, the humanity, all, all, all of us. Yeah, and um, I'm pleased to see that Integral Institute is using those tools for your work. Yeah, but I I wonder um, over the next 20 years, for example, we're almost approaching a singularity yeah. where we will have hyper intelligent. Yep, and little Ray Kurzweil. <laughs> very very yeah. high bandwidth communications in all modalities. Could you tell us something of your thoughts about how we might use these powerful technologies to build community yeah. and truly human tools that will help us on our journeys? Yeah. Yeah, because it could get very, very matrixy like if, if you're sort of thinking about that. Um, yeah, did y'all hear that? The whole point about technology and what's happening, we really are developing this kind of um, global brain, not necessarily global mind or consciousness to fill it, but we've got this, this extraordinary, um, massive connection, and we really are entering the, the information age. And in the information age, there's, there's a couple of rules. One is information is free. It's just more or less, it's free. People don't really make that kind of money charging for information. Now, but human contact, they still pay for. But what people really pay for with information is they pay for somebody to edit it. Because now that we're flooded with every single piece of information, you can get most books, uh, I mean, Amazon, you can search through most of them. You, you can get all of this free, basically. We have access to all the world's cultures. We have access to virtually every single esoteric secret ever. Every answer to every Zen koan has been published. The whole, uh, uh, the Tolkien visions have been published. These are the highest of the highest of the secret of the secret, and they're all out there. But what people don't know now, because everybody thought, especially green, healthy green, in a good way, thought, well, this is going to be great. Because now we don't need publishing houses. We can, everybody can just publish their own book and put it online. And we don't need those nasty publishing houses in, in song recordings because we'll just get rid of those. And we started to do that. And, and now what you have is an information overload. And so what do you do? You pay people to tell you what of all that information is good. In other words, you pay for editors of information. And so a, a, a company like Shambhala, it's almost no longer a physical plant, and then they print books, and they distribute those books. All Shambhala is is a name recognition that people trust. Shambhala actually, the, the entire substance of what Shambhala is, is just eight letters. It's just a word, Shambhala. And so if a Shambhala book comes out, then people tend to trust it, and they'll buy it. And that's one of the reasons that people trust names that have made their living distributing information. The editor of the New York Times said, people pay us for what we don't print. And that's, that's essentially what's starting to go on. Because now you imagine, and this is Ray Kurzweil's singularity, about 30 years from now, the rate of technological innovation is going to approach infinity. We just keep more and more innovations are made faster and faster and faster and faster. And now machines are starting to help make these revolutions. And so the machines are doing it faster and faster and faster. And if you just do a mathematical plot, about 30 years from now, it goes to infinity. Now, nobody knows what that means. For the boomers, it means that the greatest revolution in the history of the known universe is going to happen. And the boomers are in charge of it. And this is very good for them in their view. Uh, others are just that it's gonna, we're actually going to download our consciousness into computers. And we don't need our physical bodies anymore. All of that's gone. Now, I'm just kind of you know, concerned about them. You know, watch those computers carefully. You know what I mean? <laughs> 
What if they fall off the mountain or, you know, <laughs> you're gone. In the same way, life extension is probably going to go. There are very serious people looking at this. You might live to be 100,000 years old. It would be really embarrassing to get hit by a bus when you're seven and killed because then it's like, oh. I mean, you know what I mean? Died when he was seven, idiot. That would be the whole <laughs> thing. That's your tombstone. We have to rethink these things so dramatically. And most people doing future thinking like that aren't getting anywhere near as off the wall, hard to imagine as it's going to be. At a minimum, there's going to be brain-mind implants. And Kurzweil describes it as basically all the information in the world is available to you, and it just goes through this implant. And he's describing sort of the kids of the future, the enhanced humans of the future. And you ask them a question, and they'll kind of tilt their head. They're just waiting for the information to arrive. And so the information arrives, and then you blurt it out. And so there you go. That's what we've got. But now think about that. There is, you really have to take seriously the one major discovery of postmodernism, which is there is no single pre-given world. It doesn't exist. Now, it's not a social construction either. Because there's a second school of postmodernism that shows you how to get out of it. And that's namely genealogy. And genealogy, of course, goes back to Nietzsche and as uh, Foucault developed it. It's really a form of developmental psychology. And so what you're seeing here is there's not one world. There is a red world. There is an amber world. There is an orange world. There is a green world. There is a teal world, turquoise world, indigo world, violet world, ultraviolet world. At all of those worlds, you actually see different phenomena. Individuals at those levels of consciousness see different worlds, literally. And we can't point to one and say, oh, that's the right one. That's the real one. Now, what we can say is that, well, it's, if you're going to go to turquoise, you're going to have a higher, wider worldview than if you look at red. You can make those kinds of distinctions, and that's important to be able to do. But even if everybody has implants in their brain and they're tilting their heads and down comes the information, you know, how are you going to interpret it? Because that's the other main thing about states and stages or anything. You interpret your state of consciousness according to the structure that you're at. And so tilt your head, down it comes. It's a piece of information. It'll be heard differently by red. It'll be heard differently by orange. It'll be heard differently by green. So even then, this is going to even force us more to actually look at the different worldviews that humans are inhabiting. So I tend to see some real problems with that globalization of, uh, and, and using technology for that. I don't think it can be stopped. I think that's just, it's just going to happen. And so I was um, giving sort of a worst case scenario on one aspect of it, just to try and force attention to it, just to try to get people to talk about it. Ken, what I was primarily concerned about is that these systems will embody these cultural bands and uh, that we have opportunities to build many different kinds of systems. So I was wondering about your thoughts about how we can build something for our work. Yeah. Well, the one, one of the positive things about what's happening in the sort of the whole blogosphere and the whole infosphere that's going on is the downside is what Habermas pointed out, and one of the things that I've agreed with, which is just that um, people that really have a lot of time on their hands tend to dominate the dialogue. And those who are really busy, you know, writing books and changing the world and stuff, they don't tend to get involved in that as much. And that was Habermas's um, complaint, is that the intellectual quality is just sort of vanished on some of this stuff. The positive side, though, is that it lets people like us find each other. And that's a very, very important issue. And that's where I see positive stuff could come out of it in that we can use this system-wide network, which I think we will. And when we tilt our heads, waiting for that information to come down, we're waiting for information that's going to help connect us with other people around the planet who are doing this, and then also exchange best practices. 
in terms of how to do local groups, local communication, how to then uh, come up with press packages so we can meet the press with something saying, look, we are not doing the same thing that a Southern Baptist fundamentalist is doing. We're not. And we're not doing the same thing that you know standard uh, Jewish Torah is doing. We're not doing the same thing, and so on. Although we have the finest contemplative teachers in the world that say we're working with these contemplative states, and that's entirely different. So we want to be able to use this, in a sense, as a marketing uh, and a public relation and an advertising, all in the best sense, to try to get the, the word out about what's going on here. It will always, and this is a problem, what we are doing will always strongly relate to about less than 2% of the population. And that's just something we have to deal with. Cognitively, about 25% of the population will understand it and often feel attracted to it. But we need people that are going to help us work with that 2% that has a cognitive or higher cognition and a cognitive or higher self, not cognitive turquoise and self green, or cognitive turquoise and self orange. Those are very large percentage of people, but not ones that will actually work to make this happen. So part of what we have to do is get very smart about how to use that. I think we can humanize it by continuing to use it to connect with other people that are doing this. And that's sort of the positive aspect of it. But if you have any thoughts on this, and we want to, particularly we're setting up um, on our website things that allow people to exchange best practices. And I think that's a very, very good idea. <clears throat> so it's going to be best practices for how to create an integral salon on how to create a local integral life practice group. And those are the two main things that we're working on right now. And we are working on them. I'm not allowed to make any promises. Um, um, but I promise we're working on them. <laughs> so, so, and I think you've got a lot of ideas that you've been thinking about, so stay in touch with us. Thank you. <laughs>